Well, good morning. Let me ask you a question as we begin. What would you say ranks up there amongst the most important questions anyone could or should know? Now, I realize that's a wide open question. There's a lot of room there, but think about it. What would be a question or some questions that you would think of and say, of the most important things somebody needs to know, should know? What, what would those questions sound like? I have a few of them for you today, and the good news is that as we go into Hebrews chapter 13, verse 19 today, we're going to answer these three questions. So here's the first one. How important do you think it is that you know who you are and who you are not? How important do you think it is to know who somebody else is and who they are not? And perhaps even most important of all, how important is it to know how to know who is and who is not, who they think they are or are not? Well, my prayer is that you'll see today that it's eternally important and that God and his word have spoken to this over and over and over again. And today, as you can probably already tell, we're doing things a little differently. And I continue to try to show you by coming at things a little differently and yet always exactly the same in that we're going to trust God and his word no matter what. We're going to see that the word, the will, and the ways of God never change, whether it's from times past or present, whether it's in one part of the Bible or another, there is a consistency that you can build your life on, a consistency that will determine and define eternity. My prayer is that as we press in, and again, we're continuing in the book of Hebrews. If you've not been with us, this is week number 76 in the series we've entitled hold on because the message of hebrews is to hold on to christ no matter what to hold on to the truth and the love the majesty and the power the promise the purposes of almighty god as displayed in and through jesus the christ now i'm going to leave that for our context if you've not been with us please go back into our notes and you'll see we've done one long, steady, true, passionate walk through this book of Hebrews. And in the other messages, you'll find a lot more history and context. But today, I want to jump right in. I want to come to you and share with you the big idea that is not only unpacked out of Hebrews 13, 19, but is true of all of God's word. And today I'm going to take us down two parallel paths in God's Word. I, I pray that you'll see that this travels kind of like two rails on, on a railroad track. They stay parallel and together all the way to the glory of God as each will help us to better understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now the other passage in conjunction with Hebrews 13, 19 is going to be Acts chapter 2, verse 46. And my prayer is that you'll see, just like the author of Hebrews intended, that God has a plan, he has a purpose, and he has a people. And what you'll see, and here's the big idea for today, here's the timeless truth, is that true biblical Christianity, the true biblical church, is made up of Christ-like passion, prayer, and people. Christ-like passion, Christ-like prayer, and Christ-like people. Now, that's been the design from the very beginning, and it is consistent throughout Scripture. But don't take my word for it. Be a Berean. Let's go into the Scriptures, and let's see this together. By way of preview, there are three big components, three big pillars in Hebrews 13, 19 that are consistent with the Word of God. And that is, you and I will see in this verse a Christ-like passion, a call to Christ-like prayer, and a portrait of the Christ-like people that are the family of God. So let's go ahead and take a look at what this is going to live like, 
look like and love like. But let me start off where I did a couple of years ago, coming into the message on Acts 2, 46. And again, let's take this parallel path to the glory of God. Watch this, join me in this prayer, and then we'll jump in to today's message. Friends, I want to welcome you to our 29th week in the series entitled Miraculous Metamorphosis as we continue to walk down the disciples' path and learn what it is to be the people of God on a journey with Jesus. I tell you before I prayed together with you this morning that this is a day that I pray you'll share with your friends, your family, your co-workers. It's my prayer that our time together today in God's word will be definitive for you. You see, I fully expect that today, heaven is going to celebrate. The hearers of God's word will contemplate and praise God, hell will commiserate because our king and his glory will be exalted. I want to ask you to pray a five-point prayer with me as we get ready for our time together under the teaching and preaching of God's word. God's word. Father, I come to you, and now not only on behalf of myself, but for the people I shepherd and those that we will have the privilege of sharing your truth and love with. Lord, you know my prayer. I pray that your clarity, your clarity, will come through today so that people will get it. And I pray, Lord, secondly, for your discernment, because I know in the past I have gotten it and missed it at the same time. That it's not enough to have clarity, that we must have your discernment so that what we see clearly, we understand rightly. Third, Lord, I pray that we together as a family will have your courage to accept your truth in your love, no matter what. Lord, with that courage, I pray then forth for your love, because I know that we can get it clearly and understood and have the courage to do it, but if it's not with the right heart, we're wrong. So I pray, Lord, that we... Receive your love and your heart in this time. And lastly, Lord, I pray for your peace that will allow your family to say, I've heard from dad. I know his word. And our family, as Joshua said, you, you choose for you what you'll do. But as for me and my house, from this day on, we will serve the Lord. Let that be our cry, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen and amen. Well, and again, today I say amen and amen. I, I hope that you see that that was a day that we determined to set the course to the same destination where we're going today. And that is to understand what it is to be the people of God, to embrace the exhortation that is to be the family of God. Let me now just take you into the scripture. Hebrews 13, verse 19. Here's the verse, and again, listen for the passion, the prayer, and the people to be elevated out of the scriptures, and then we'll unpack it. It's God's word that says, I urge you, I urge you, the more earnestly to do this, to do this, in order that I may be restored to you all the sooner. Now, obviously, I'm using the inflection of my voice to try to make a point, but I pray that you're hearing this. Hear the passion. I want to break down a number of ways. This first component, the passion. I urge you, I urge you the more earnestly to do this. When we think about the urging, note here in the Christian context, when we are urging, we're calling for authenticity. We're bringing to point the fact that we're going to add to clarity. We're ultimately calling the others to be this essence of Christianity. Let me just try to help embellish this understanding of urging by again taking us back to that day two years ago when we looked at Acts 2.46. Watch this, and I pray, let the urging come into a greater context for you. 
my prayer is that you and I will know this blessing of being the family of God. You see, we're going to focus in on Acts chapter 2 verse 46. And in the Disciples Path curriculum this week, the concentration is on living out your life as the church in biblical community. And here's the text. I'm going to share it with you. Concentrate on one key word in particular, and then we'll spend the rest of our time unpacking it. God's word, Acts 2 verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple together, together, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Our friends at the Disciples Path will tell you that the big idea, the timeless truth for today is this, and I quote, we are called to live authentically and interdependently with one another in biblical community, end quote. Now, let me just preface that and remind you, for those of you that don't know, in the New Testament alone, there are 100 one another passages. So, I pray that before we finish today that you will see both the blessing and the beauty of being Christ's unified body. Let me say that again. It's my prayer that before we're done today, you will understand in a way that shapes your eternity the blessing and the beauty of being Christ's unified body. That this is not something that's up for options. It's not up for debate biblically. And so what I'd like you to do is think about forks in the road. If I can use my hands to illustrate. We're going to have to come through, you and me, every single day. And in terms of our understanding of what it is to be a Christian and to be the church. We're going to have to come through some defining forks in the road. And so if you think of this as that fork in the road. And I'm going to show you three of them. And, and here's what I want you to do. Instead of thinking of them as equally divergent, allow me, if you will, to presume upon you that one way is right, and it is due north. And so the forks in the road are not between neutral options. They're between right, the straight and narrow, and wrong. So here's the three forks in the road that get at what it is to be together. First and foremost is the church... A people or a place? Secondly, do you find yourself in the church prayerfully called and placed by God? Or playfully where you like to go and play? And where it's fun? And, and where we have things in common? And we love to potluck together? And we have kids that play Little League together? And... And thirdly, another fork in the road. Am I in a place or am I the people? And am I as the people purposely living passionately together? Or am I simply pragmatically in proximity? And what I pray that you will see before we finish today is that being the church is being a people who are prayerfully placed and purposely, passionately living together. That is the straight and narrow road. And few will find it, by the way. And if you press in, you'll find that I'm paraphrasing a trustworthy teacher when I tell you that. Or is church a place that you playfully pick and pragmatically just stand in proximity to each other? This is definitive when you come to understand this word together. So here I've just simply tried to underscore what it means to urge, to understand the urging, the dynamic, the, the intensity, the, the passion. Well, let's look at the next word. I urge you. It's personal. It's relational. There's not just a sense of intensity. There's a sense of purpose and it is personal it's relational. Friends, brothers and sisters urge each other because real life together 
it involves this passion and the passion comes from down deep in the roots and it gets lived out through the fruits of each other's lives. What you'll find is that this personal and missional dynamic of the urging I urge you, it's at the heart of another one of those both and tensions in the Christian life. You see, friends, when our witness is being shared together, when my urging you and your urging me is for the glory of God, this is the witness that Jesus said would be the voice to the world that would tell the world that he is Lord, that our being unified in this urging and sense of urgency is the very calling card in part of the heart of Almighty God. Here again, I take you back a couple of years to Acts chapter 2 to see the portrait of the family of God and look at how closely Acts 2 and Hebrews 13 mirror one another missionally for you and me. You need to ask yourself what kind of root system you have. Let me explain. There are two options for us. We can either be a redwood forest or a Christmas tree farm. Redwood forest or Christmas tree farm. You see, the body of Christ is to be living in this oneness and this unified sense so that to the world and in the midst of life and its storms, we are actually a redwood forest. Let me show you a picture of a redwood forest. And I want you to note the size of the little tiny people. Do you see, just in terms of perspective... The forest is so much bigger than the little people. Do you know that the redwood trees tend to get up to about 300 feet? And on average, their root system only goes down about five or six feet. That seems impossible. But what most people don't know is that their root systems go out about 100 feet and interlock and intertwine and redwoods grow very close together and they live a life in the forest of interconnectivity and interdependability and in part with that they grow to be this majestic forest. It's based on their root system, their proximity to one another. The church is called to be this portrait. By contrast, let me show you a picture of a Christmas tree farm. I've intentionally put the little guy there, and he's quite large in comparison to the tree. He's also made a sport for a holiday to cut down a tree. Christmas trees, and most others, grow independent of any other tree. And so they look alike. They're relatively close together. They serve a purpose. It's no big deal if you cut them down every once in a while but there's nothing majestic at all about the Christmas tree farm. Christians need to understand that God created us to be interconnected with a purpose to bring glory to God and that it's in our root system connectivity and our shared commitment to bring glory to God that he sees the glory he deserves. Friends, you and I need to understand as we look at Acts chapter 2, particularly the closing verses, this portrait of what it is to be the church, that the church is not a car wash that you go to to get the outside cleaned up. It's not a classroom in and of itself where you go to get your head filled. It's not a convenience store where you make a quick stop off to get the things that you want and just keep going. It's not a country club where you get a massage. Not a circus or a carnival that puts on a show. The church is the called out, set apart people of God that have been captured by grace and put on this planet to bring glory to God in part by living out our lives together. Think about it. Paul told the Corinthians that if it were not for the resurrection of our Christ, then we would be more foolish and worthy of mocking than anybody else on the planet. It's the proof of the resurrection that speaks so powerfully to the world of the truth of the lordship of Jesus the Christ. Well, what is the evidence of the risen Christ? It's the body of Christ. We are the evidence to the world. The degree to which we live like Christmas tree farms 
where it's all about us and there's just a superficial proximity and not a passionate unity, we're sending a perverted message to the world. Here again, I pray now, all of a sudden, these few words, I urge you, begin to have a whole new context, a, a deeper meaning, I pray for you. And now notice, if that's happening, and just as your heart comes alive, it's as though God and the author of Hebrews are going to jump on you and me and make sure that we get it even more. Because the next words are, I urge you the more earnestly. It's, it's pig piling on. It's saying, hang on, if you think it's intense, it's not intense enough. I urge you the more earnestly. Please hear this. You've got to come to understand that Christianity is not a joke. This is not some, some stroll from here to heaven. Friend, intensity is built into the integrity of Christianity. Do you hear, as the author says, I urge you more earnestly, do you hear this call to courage instead of cowardice? The commitment to supernatural ties instead of superficial ties. A call to commitment instead of compromise. A call to commitment instead of complacency. Hear God's word. Remember, we're in Hebrews where people were drifting away, disconnecting, dilly-dallying, disobeying, denying and defying Christ, all thinking it was fine, it was okay. There's an intensity here in the integrity of Christianity, and it's calling all of us, this word of God, to embrace the tension, the both and tension of, yes, we are free, and at the same time, we're to walk by faith through this swamp and this sin-soaked world, and we're to do it together. And the degree to which we do, as we live out this faith as the family of God, the world will take notice. That's the point. Again, I pray, watch this and grow in your understanding in this urging and sense of urgency. I think of it this way. Those who have a superficial vertical relationship will settle for and seek out superficial horizontal relationships. It only makes sense. But if you have a supernatural vertical relationship, you'll seek out and settle for nothing less than supernatural horizontal relationships. This is what the Word of God teaches us. You and I will see what David Platt has said is true from God's Word this morning. David Platt has said in his book, Radical Together, I quote, if you and I want our lives to count for God's purpose in the world, we need to begin with a commitment to God's people in the church. God has called us to lock arms with one another in single-minded, death-defying obedience to one objective, the declaration of his gospel for the demonstration of his glory to all nations. This is God's design for his people, and it's worth giving our lives to. Friends, I pray that you and I will walk away from our time together today better understanding not the options of church, but the true optimum being of church. Amen. Let me give you the context for our verse. Again, our verse is Acts 2, verse 46, but I want to read for you Acts 2, beginning in verse 36, and just walking through, and then we'll take our time to unpack some very key clauses. So here's God's word, Acts 2, verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ. He is the both and. He is Lord, Master, and Christ, anointed Messiah. This Jesus whom you crucified. Note this, Peter now speaking. This is not how you win people over if you're looking to stroke their egos. He says, you crucified him. Verse 37. Now when they heard, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. What do you mean they were cut to the heart? What cuts to the heart? Oh, we were just there. That's the sword of the spirit. That's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God cuts to the heart. Friends, this is God at work. This is grace in action. This is love on display. 
Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? They have a want to, to get right with God. What must we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and... Now let's just sit with that for a second. Peter, apparently you went to the Jesus school of preaching. This is not how you win them. Repent and more... Yes, love calls people to repent. Truth says the gospel begins with the acknowledgement of sin and the need to repent. And it's not a one and done deal. You and I need to repent every day. We need to have our lives gospeled every day. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift. Note this. Hang on. I have to do this, and I receive a gift. Hang on. Hang on. It can't be a gift if you're telling me I have to. It says here in my Bible... Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is the both and that we've been talking about for years. It's all of grace and it brings the responsibility that calls you and me to action. There's the both and. It's all of grace and those who have received it will respond in faithful obedience. Verse 39. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Everyone. So here we go again. Well, hang on. You said it's, it's for everyone. But it's not everyone goes to heaven. No, he says it's for everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Do you see again the tension of the both and? Friends, we've got to understand what it is to be the people of God if we're going to rightly represent him. And here again, I pray you see this urging, this sense of urgency with clarity, bringing Christianity into focus. Now look what happens next. The verse continues. I urge you the more earnestly to do, to do. Friends, worship is a verb. You've got to understand this, that at the heart is a passion, a passion that is shared, a passion to do that comes out of your gift to be, that you have a get to, a passion to do. That's what we have here. You see, when that passion is real, then worshiping workers, they don't quit. They, they, they don't cut and run. When this passion is there in the DNA, you won't have quitters. You won't have it. Why? Because the passion is what holds on. It's a God-given gift. This, this is what it is to be a witness whose life of faithful obedience is worshiping and working and walking all in sync with God's intended plan and purposes. That's why we say with passion, with a sense of urgency, we urge people to surrender to victory if they're outside of a saving relationship and to surrender back into victory if they've stumbled and are in the midst of a free fall. Come on back into intimacy with God and his family. You've got to understand, friends, that, that our ways and our methods are just as important as God's word and God's message. That it's not enough to say you know what he said. You've got to do what he said. It's not enough to say, I'll do it my way. You've got to do it his way. This is what it is to be the church. This is at the heart of urging one another. It's the iron sharpening iron. It's the brother and sister loving one another through thick and thin. Now you'll see in a moment what we're urging about and what the focus will be as we shift to prayer. But before we do that, again, take another closer look to understand this context. Verse 40, and with many other words, you mean Peter didn't shut up there? <laughs> Peter, you've said enough, don't you think? And with many other words, he bore witness. 
We're back to Acts 1.8. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses. It means you'll tell the truth in love all the time. Many more words he used to bore witness and he continued to exhort them. Oh boy, that's when Peter goes from preaching to meddling. That's when you get the urging, the exhorting that doesn't leave you alone. Loves you too much to leave you alone. Loves you enough to risk you not liking them. And with many more words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked or wicked generation. Save yourselves? I thought this was all of grace and it's a gift. Yes, it is. Well, what's this save yourself thing? That's your responsibility to walk in faithful obedience. You mean I can ultimately save myself? No, it's all of grace. Your works will do nothing. And yet you're called to do all the work that you can that is in line with the grace that you've been given. Amen. This is the truth of God's word. Verse 41, so those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. The miraculous work of God. We don't win people with winsome strategies. We don't scare them into heaven or out of hell. We can't open up a waiting room for heaven and think that just because it's packed full of smiling people with tuna casseroles that everybody's on their way to heaven. This is a work of God and his grace. Verse 41. Those who received his word. Friends, I speak to you from the deepest part of my heart. I pray to God you'll receive God's word. You and I have to decide, and this, this is between each one of us in and of ourselves. This is with you and Jesus. You've got to decide whether or not you're going to trust your intuition or God's inspiration. You've got to decide if you're going to trust your intuition or God's inspiration. And I'm just telling you, when you and God's word line up on opposite sides of the issue, you're wrong. Whether it's you personally or people that you love. Is it going to be your intuition or God's inspiration? How about you, friend? Who are you going to trust? What path will you take? The, the scriptures are consistently urging us with a sense of urgency here all the more earnestly to do, to engage, to be. Now listen as the verse moves on and we now get some clarity here in the context because what we hear next is I urge you, I urge you the more earnestly to do this. Now the word this is pointing back to the beginning of verse 17 to Pray for us. This is a call, a sense of urgency and urging for prayer. Now we've spent the last two weeks unpacking verse 18 and seeing this plea, this passion for prayer. The leaders needing and asking for this prayer. Here again we see it, it's very personal. I, I urge you to do this, to pray well, who's going to pray? Who are the people of prayer? It's the family of God. Whose prayer counts? Whose prayer has power? Whose prayer fulfills the purposes of God? It's the brother and sister ambassadors in the family of God. That's what you and I see. Those who will be, the beers are the doers who are praying as people of God. Oh, friend, I pray that you are hearing and seeing this, that it's a personal call to you for passion in prayer. Again, let's go back to Acts and see as this comes together. Listen to verse 42, and this is where we begin to do some real unpacking. Verse 42, this is where most people will tell you, you begin to see the portrait of the early church. It says, and they, and I want to stop right there, and I want to ask you, who's they? Who's the they that opens up in Acts 2.42? It's the new supernaturally drawn by God baptized true biblical believers, right? Well, that's the they that we are. We are this they. 
if we are the New Testament, born again, spirit-filled, cross-carrying champions of Christ Jesus our King. So what applies to this they applies to us. Over a hundred times in the New Testament, the word for church is used, ecclesia. Approximately 90% of that over 100 usage applies to a local body of believers. There is a global church, praise God, we're a part of it and we're illustrating it. But make no mistake, when the church is referenced in the New Testament, the overwhelming predominant message is a local, accountable, supernaturally unified, passionate people on mission together. Now, does that not just ring true to you? This, this passage that we see in Hebrews 13, 19, I urge you the more earnestly to do this, to do this. Next, in order that. Now you're going to get a sense of purpose. Do you see this? Now, it's all of grace, but it's by yours and my faith being lived out. It's to do this so that our passion, our prayer has a purpose, and God has promised to fulfill this. You see, Faithful followers live for Christ. That's what we're urging. We're seeking with passion the prayer that will help us all to be this people of God. Because God's people live out God's priorities. We pray for God's people. We pray for God's priorities. And it's only God's people that can do this in God's power. That's the essence of Acts 1.8. But Again, I say to you, do you see this? I urge you the more earnestly to do this. I personally am seeking your passion in prayer to do this so that, as you'll see, that we can be the people of God for his glory, demonstrating his, his grace and living out and extending the gospel. Again, the very essence of the entire book of Acts. But let's go back to Acts 2 and again see this dovetailing in. I pray that you get the foundation that we need to be who Christ has called us to be. This is at the essence of it. So let me just give it to you scripturally. Who are we? Who is the they of the early church? Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. Those saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast, but those who are the workmanship of God who have been saved for good works. Let me give it to you this way, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 through 21. For the love of Christ controls us. The love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves. Sounds like lordship to me. He died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves but for him. Who for their sake died and was raised. From now on therefore we regard no one according to the flesh. No one. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, get this friends, if you're a biblical believer, this is your crowning jewel and promise. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, let me be clear, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Friends, you and I are either in Christ or we are not. We are either the church or we are not. And no amount of time spent under a steeple will make you the people of God. 
Either he has supernaturally done it or it hasn't been done. If you and I go home and sleep in the garage tonight, there's no chance anybody wakes up an automobile in the morning. This is a miraculous work of God. Again, friends, I pray that you see this. This is the urging. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that, so there's the purpose, and now watch, in order that I may be restored. Restored. Now, this word restore, this is huge. It's not revisit. It's not to come back. No, that's a part of it. But if all that was wanted or needed or meant to be expressed was a return, then you could honestly and openly say, do this and pray that I may return. But God and his word are so deliberate, so specific. Here's the passion and the prayer. The prayer is that the author of Hebrews, now for the first time in the book, speaking personally, I am talking to you. I urge you to pray more earnestly than ever so that I may be restored to you. This word restored, it means to make whole. It's used in the scriptures of people having ailments healed, uh, unhealthy body being restored to health, blindness being restored to sight, Christians being restored to Christ. What you're seeing here is a demonstration of koinonia. You're seeing the passion and the prayer for a person to come back into the people of God with this passion and this understanding of koinonia. You see, the real lovers of God long for koinonia. There's a want to that's built into the saving grace. It's part of who we are as the family of God. And at the same time, it's only the restored who are truly the redeemed. You'll see this more and more here in a moment. But understand, this is the passion. This is the prayer. It's to be the people and to understand who is and who is not in this place. Watch this and then we'll come back and we'll continue. Let me point out something grammatically that's important. And awe came upon every soul. That's before the signs and wonders. There's a conjunction that comes next and says, and. The reason that's important, it's the koinonia that brought everybody to their attention. It's the koinonia that showed the world as Jesus prayed it would, that he is awe-inspiring. The signs and wonders came next, and that's the cherry on top. Verse 44, and note this, this is key. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. The together here, the Greek is epi. The Greek is epi. It reads in English together. It's important because this epi is the Christmas tree farm. It's the proximity. It's the physical closeness. You need to have epi. If you're going to have koinonia, you, you, you need to have a connection of the heart. There needs to be a true connection. However, watch this. And all who believed were together epi and had all things in common and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. Note this, they're not communists and they're not in a commune. They're the church. They're meeting the needs and coming alongside. Verse 46, here's our text. And day by day, attending the temple together. It's not epi. It's not a physical proximity. This is the word that I pray that you'll never, ever forget. Day by day, attending the temple together. This is hamath u madon. Hamath u madon. It's a compound Greek word. It's so much more than simply being close to each other. It's made up of two words. The first one comes from homo. It means singular oneness, indivisible. Second half means passion, riotous passion, the kind of passion that takes over who you are. So they are coming to church together. They are coming together as koinonia with an indivisible oneness and unity, supernatural unity that has a passion that will not be stopped and arrests the attention of the onlooking world. 
I won't take you through all of the scriptures, but this word is used 11 times in the New Testament. 10 of them are in the book of Acts, and the last one, the 11th, is in the book of Romans as kind of a crowning jewel at the end of Romans. You'll find this word, hamath umadon, this togetherness. Some of you, Tom's King James, will read one accord, or some of your translations will say one mind. It's a supernatural passion that in the positive for Christ, it means that these became the people who were an unstoppable force of faith for Jesus the Christ and his kingdom. The word is also used in a negative sense. This is what was used to describe those who came to stone and kill Stephen. The opposition is also passionate, is also unified. This is at the heart of spiritual warfare. Friends, if you're going to be the church, we need to be unified supernaturally in koinonia, living out this hamath umadon, this passionate oneness that lives at a riotous level for the glory of our God. It's used again in the negative sense when Paul in Acts 19 is dragged out by the riotous crowd. They too were unified with a passion to destroy the Christ and his church. Also again for the third time in Acts, it's used in the same way. When they couldn't find Paul, so they went for his traveling companions. And the riotous came in and dragged them out. But know this, the word is also used to describe how people responded to Philip when he got to Samaria. The word is also used to demonstrate how the church prayed and thanked God after John and Peter had been dealt with by the government officials and they would not back down. Friends, this is our DNA. This is who we are. And I say to you, at the risk of ruffling feathers, there are people that are telling you that that's not true and they're liars. There are people telling you that I make too much of that. I hear on the street that we're a cult. They're liars. There are people that want you to think that you can plug and play wherever you want and that you're calling. It doesn't matter. Hey, church is church is church. You think you're the only good church. That's not true either. I know that we're the called people of God that have been supernaturally put together with a purpose. And if and when anyone takes aim at trying to divide or break that, they are working against the God of the Bible. And you need to know that. No matter who it is, no matter where it is, no matter when it is. You tear down what God has built in his word you say things like ecclesia. It can be a place. Hey, playfully pick what you want. And so long as you're in proximity, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be passionately purposed. You don't have to be a people. It's okay to be a place. Those are lies from the pit of hell. Friends, I pray that you see, whether it's in Acts or Hebrews or anywhere else in the scripture, that you see this. The biblical account, this, this holy homothumadon, this koinonia, they reveal our king to the world. When you take this passion, this prayer, and this people, you have biblical church. You take those out, and you've got something else. It's critically important that you know who you are, and that you know who you are not. If you have been indwelt with the Spirit of God, you will have this passion. You will have this sense of prayer. You will long for and love being this people. Not perfectly, but the seeds of God's truth and love, His Spirit in you and me, bring this to bear. You see it in the restored to you. This is that sense of urgency in the unity of God's people. It's not just a generic sense of truths. These are not theological facts that sit up on a shelf. This is the truth and the DNA of what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And again, I say to you, whether you go to the birth of the church in Acts 2, or you come here to the close of Hebrews where there's a desperate attempt to reach out to those who are drifting and disconnecting and dis disobeying and denying and defying Christ. It's the same message. It's the same DNA. It's the same truth and love. Watch this, and I pray that you're being both informed 
and inspected. I pray you're being inspired through this truth from God's word. I want to leave you with one more video before we close. And again, this is two years ago. Watch this. Somebody's got to be right. Somebody's got to be wrong. What do you do with that? Well, without 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 and a commitment to the authority of God's word and a surrendering to him and his word, I'll tell you what you do. You have chaos. And then you have massive division. And then you have a witness that the world mocks. And then you are an anemic representation of a mighty power. This is why the purity of the body and the commitment to the purity of God's word, not just in definition, but in application, becomes so key. And not just in application, but in attitude is so key because it's tied back to our witness. It's not just for our well-being, although our blessing is connected to our faithful obedience, but more important than our blessing is our witness, right? You show the world a church that's divided over foundational core applications, and you see a world that is looking at a splintered bride. Oh, I saw, yeah, I saw the leg of the bride over, I saw an arm over there. The whole thing's not all that attractive, dismemberment just kind of turns me off, you know. This is why Jesus was so clear about the power and the necessity of the unity. And I'm here to tell you, it's the Spirit of God that supernaturally unifies us. It's the Word of God that defines and defends that unity. This is why it's so important that those that you and I encounter, those that you and I know, and frankly, you and I, we surrender to the authority of God's word. And back to that higher math when it's not so easy, it's when God's word contradicts our actions or our attitudes. It's when God's word demands change where change is not wanted or embraced. You as an ambassador of God's word, you as an ambassador of God, you're the one that shows up and says, this is what the Lord says. And you're either perverting it in the way that you're trying to twist it, or you're denying it, or you're just flat out disobeying it. But I love you too much to leave you in that. So I'm going to call you to surrender to God's word and his way, to come under the authority of his will as expressed in his word. This is where it gets hard. Friends, that's the truth and love, and it's timeless and it never changes. This is the call on all of our lives. This is the privilege in our lives. This is what grace looks like lived out. This is what the gospel in application means. This is the biblical call in our lives. You know, anybody that's willing to try to bust that or break that or divide that up, watch out. This is the call of God. David Platt says, unleashing radical people into the world requires the gospel as our foundation and our motivation. You and I must embrace a gospel that both saves us from work and saves us to work. We live sacrificially, not because we feel guilty, but because we have been loved greatly. And now we find satisfaction in sacrificial love for others. Okay. Here we come now in for a landing. I pray that the weaving together of Acts 2 and Hebrews 13 have brought to you a greater sense of clarity that you see better yet Christianity in the full blossom and bloom of God's beauty and his intentions. That you see here the passion from God's people in the prayer for and from God's people and in the very DNA of the people themselves. Here's the word. Listen again. I urge you the more earnestly, more earnestly to do this, to pray, in order that I personally may be restored to you, to you, the sooner. Hear the urgency 
in the faithful, obedient call. Hear the urgency in the unity, in the mission. Hear the urgency in the call for authenticity to be. Friend, I pray that when you see Hebrews 13, 19, you're reminded of all of Scripture's call for the people of God to be the prayerful, the passionate, the genuine people of God. I I want you to think about this. It's the passion that is to fill God's people. It's the prayer that is to fuel God's people. And it's the people of God who are to go find the people of God. We find the lost and then we grow the fount to the glory of God. When you pull all this together, all of it, I want to share with you something that I did back a couple of years ago from that same day that to me still encapsulates perhaps the most beautiful portrait of this truth and love being lived out that I've ever seen. And I pray that this will bless you. Listen with your heart and then we'll come back and we'll pray to close. Look at the last usage of Hamath Umadon together, passionate oneness. It's Romans 15, 5 and 6. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together, Hamath Umadon, you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is who we are. Blessed to be together. May we see the blessing and the beauty of being Christ's unified body. I want to leave you with the question, what do you want? Do you want superficial relationships? Or do you want to be a living witness of supernatural relationships? This week, death has come across my door in ways that have been alarming. I want to read you a letter from one of my son's closest friends, a family that we have prayed for as their little infant son was fighting for his life. I want you to hear what is perhaps for me the most God-glorifying letter I have ever read. And I want you to hear the glory that goes to God and the gift that it is to be God's family. Friends and family, I wrote this letter about 11 days ago as a final update about baby Elijah. But I didn't have the stomach to send it until now. This was Thursday of this week. In Acts 26, as the Apostle Paul is standing before King Agrippa as a prisoner and arguing his case for the gospel, he declares, quote, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. The hope of reconciliation with God was so real to Paul that he was able to look at the king while he himself was still in chains. And he could say in chains, I wish you were like me. I wish you had what I have. Two days ago, we buried our second son, Elijah. He was born on June 21st and he died on June 27th at 4.05 p.m. We have grieved much from the first day that we found out about our son's disorder, but We have not grieved like the world grieves. Our grief has not been a black, hopeless grief. No. As our pastor CJ would say, quote, we have steel in our hearts, end quote. We have the steel of the gospel. Amen. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we have perfect faith in that second person of the Trinity who hung hopelessly on the cross. That good shepherd, his father placed all of our sins on his own son so that we might never taste the bitterness of death eternal, so that we might be reconciled to his great God. And we have known the presence of God more deeply as a result of this bitter season. 
When God sees fit to take away one's child, it feels like he has taken out vital organs from your chest and your gut. But then he comes. He himself comes. And he comforts you. It is difficult to explain the deep and abiding comfort of God's own presence in your life. Sometimes he feels so near that it feels physical. It is so real. I don't know what to call that. Is it mystical? I don't know. But it is a joy unspeakable. When God takes your child, he takes a part of you. But when God takes a part of you, that part of you is in heaven with him. There's nothing like close proximity to Christ. As Samuel Rutherford used to say, God gives crosses to bear, but he placed the heaviest part of that cross on his own son. In the same way that a father acts like he needs his little son's help to carry something heavy, and his son thinks he's actually doing the heavy lifting by simply putting his hand under it, we feel like Christ has given us a cross to bear, but in reality, he has already borne it. At other times, now note this, Koinonia family, Hamath Umadon family, at other times, he comforts us through his body, which is the church. In our day of individualism, many, many are going around without any real community or koinonia. And when difficulty comes, they have no choice but to depend on the state or upon professionals, or they just grit their teeth and try to get through it. The problem is, they don't really get through it. Because a secular society has nothing of hope to offer with regards to eternity and death. Sure, it steals poetic portions from Christianity and tries to sugarcoat it for their society. But death is rancid and it can't be sugarcoated. The only way to undo it is to reverse it and Christ makes all things new. Amen. This is the message of the church. For the Christian, in the midst of death, he has the privilege of being caught up by the arms of Christ and he has the privilege of being caught up by the church. We, speaking now of them as a family, have known an abundance of comforters and I, I am jealous for others to know this comfort that we have experienced. I wish to God that they might become such as I am except for these chains. Oh, how I wish that all could know the love of Christ and the sweetness that is his body. But the world is full of places, peoples and villages who know nothing of Christ. The name of Jesus is not on the lips of parents as their children die or on their lips as war rapes their country. There's no church in many places to comfort them. We feel that we cannot sit still with this comfort. It makes us restless for the nations. It was not meant to lull us to sleep, but rather it was meant to launch us into a dying world. Our dear family and friends, we have no words to express our overwhelming gratefulness. Thank you for the way that you have loved us. Thank you for the way that you have served us. Thank you for the way that you have given to us, cried with us, laughed with us, visited us, sung with us, read the Bible to us, and prayed for us. You have loved us well. You have not left us wanting. I wish that you could experience all that we have experienced. All but these chains. This is what it is to be the church. Hamath Umadon. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together, Hamath Umadon, you may with one voice glorify God, God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we forever be the bride and the body the blessed and the beautifully together people of God. Friends, I pray, I literally pray, I urge you 
all the more earnestly to do and to be this people. To do this. To bring this passion, this prayer, this people to bear. To penetrate the darkness with the truth and the love of what it is to be the embodiment of the bride of Christ. I pray that you will never ever settle for anything less. That you'll understand that this is the biblical bullseye. It is the aim of every Bridge family member, I pray. I pray that you will embrace this call to urgency through this urging of God's word that we may be restored together in this koinonia, hamathumadon, grace-based mission of God, no matter what. Lord, I thank you so much for the truth and the love of your word. I thank you that I get to serve a people who have a desire to be your people. Help us to reach the world, to expose the counterfeits, and to elevate the truth of what it is to be the biblical church, no matter what. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.